I want to uh, welcome everybody to our uh, regular series of critical issues confronting China. And our speaker today is uh, Sui Sheng, or some people call him Sam uh, Zhao, uh, who is editor of the Journal of Contemporary China. I will ask uh, Nick to uh, say a few words about how we do the question, and then I will uh, introduce uh, Sui Sheng. Nick? Thank you, Ezra. Um, for those of you who have been with us before, you'll, you'll be familiar with Zoom if this is your first time. Um, there is a menu bar that you have access to, um, usually at the bottom of your screen, and it has a Q&A tab. Um, this is where you should enter your questions. If you'd like to enter them anonymously, you may do so, but if you choose to um, not enter them anonymously, please include your name and your affiliation, just so that we know who's asking the question. Um, we'll try to get through as many as we can at the end of the session. Thanks. Um, the first time I visited China was 1973. I had the good luck of being on a uh, delegation, the first uh, scientific delegation. At that time, uh, Zhao Suisheng uh, was just entering Beijing University, and that's where I, uh, uh, just at the time when I was starting in 1973. Uh, at that time, of course, uh, students were Gong Bing. Uh, but uh, by the time he went to get his MA in economics at Beida, uh, that was already Gaokao. So he had to take the examination with the Gaokao at uh, Beida for economics. And then he uh, came to the United States. He got an MA uh, in sociology. Um, uh, and then uh, he went to San Diego for a PhD. And PhD he did in political science uh, with Susan Shirk and with others there. And the amazing thing is that while he was still a graduate student, he started a little, uh, small little journal, the Journal of Contemporary China, which is now in volume 29. Uh, so to start a, gra uh, start a journal as a graduate student is pretty amazing. Uh, and uh, now that we're in the 29th year of the Journal of Contemporary China, some people rank it above the, uh, the China Quarterly as, as a leading journal. It's certainly a leading journal. So <clears throat> in the meantime, while he was uh, starting that journal at the University of Denver, where he's uh, been for the last uh, few decades, uh, he has also written a lot of work, books on all kinds of different topics. He's written about China-Taiwan relations. He's written uh, about uh, local uh, society. Uh, he's uh, written uh, about uh, foreign policy. Uh, and his title today, so I won't take any more time, uh, is China Reexamines uh, the Post-World War II Order. So without further ado, Sui Xiang, it's yours. OK, thank you. Uh, uh, Professor Vogel and also the uh, Fairbank Center, which uh, has been my uh, s admired so many years. And uh, it's a really uh, great honor to be invited and uh, to have this opportunity to share my works. Uh, this is a very prestigious uh, uh, forum. Uh, let me uh, put my... Uh, So do you see the screen there? Mark, is the screen coming on? Do you see the screen? Yes, the screen is showing. Okay, good. So uh, the subject I'm going to discuss is uh, uh, China exams, re-exams, the post-World War II order, uh, which I just published an article. I mean, in fact, I published two articles on the subject. Uh, the most recent one forthcoming is uh, the rhetoric and the uh, practice of uh, reality of the uh, China's uh, global leadership implications uh, 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 for the US-led world order and the liberal globalization. So the talk is based primarily on the, these two articles. Uh, uh, if you are interested in those articles, uh, let me know. I can send the links of those articles to me. So uh, this question is raised uh, about uh, China uh, exams and uh, the post-World War II order because uh, China is a rising power. And uh, China has a total, very, very its own interest and uh, values uh, 
uh, in the uh, context of the current post-World War II order. To understand uh, the, 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 uh, the issue, let's look at first the, okay, and let's uh, define what is the order, what order, conceptualization of the order. There are three um, points I want to emphasize. Uh, when we talk the wor world order, we are talking about dominant values, roles, and norms that define the terms of the global governance and give shape and substance to international society at any uh, given moment. The global order has been evolving all the time. In fact, that it has been constructed using the constructivist uh, <laughs> uh, 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 lens, uh, constructed and reconstructed uh, constantly in history. Now, who are the constructors or the rule makers? Obviously, those are the great powers. And those weak states are basically the rule takers. And emerging powers like China, often the challengers uh, that try to find prevailing roles and norms, they find desirable to, con to align with their own values and interests. Mm -hmm. So in that context, uh, uh, a very important, several very important uh, issues, uh, questions are raised using this uh, con conception. Uh, China as a rising power. Is China content to preserve or discontented to overhaul the post-World War II order which has been constructed under the U.S. leadership. So then what is the uh, challenges? Uh, what are the challenges of China to the U.S.-led post-World War II order? The, another very important question is, is China ready to replace the U.S.-led order with a China-led order? Unfortunately, there are no consensus or agreement. There are a lot of writings now about uh, uh, China and the uh, uh, existing international order. I divide them into three different positions. One is a liberal view, like uh, John Eikenberry, those people, uh, liberals argue that uh, the post-World War II order is a liberal, open, rules-based, and non-discrimination creating opportunities for China to advance its expanding interests within the order. And uh, especially now, when we talk about uh, globalization, those kind of liberal globalization has produced uh, so-called international in interdependence <laughs> and increased common stakes uh, for China to collaborate with other countries on those uh, important global issues. In fact, uh, uh, China's self-interest in this case would constrain China's involvement in the international air, uh, affairs to make sure it becomes so-called uh, stakeholder, uh, or responsible stakeholder, that's what people talk about. The second view I look at is the so-called anonymous view, which is the most uh, uh, realist-based uh, 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 argument. Uh, they argue that uh, uh, China uh, uh, is discont discounted, uh, discontented uh, over the uh, liberal order. And uh, they have challenged not only the predominant position of the United States, but also try to challenge the liberal international norms and intuitions. This argument has gained momentum in last uh, 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 months, in this year, uh, in a, amid the uh, pandemic, uh, because uh, people are talking about uh, uh, the, the post-American order, uh, because the U.S. has uh, not been able to uh, lead the world uh, or the so-called liberal international order, taking uh, responsible positions, and China has uh, stepped in. And uh, the third view, I use the term the wait and see, wait a minute. Wait a minute. These anonymous um, uh, view, they argue that, argue that uh, uh, is uh, overblown, and, and it's for now. 
and uh, China has changed, but does not amount to existential threat to the world order because China still is far away uh, uh, from the position to do that behind the US in on every aspect. And also China does not have uh, enough soft power and hard power uh, to uh, um, place, to put its, itself in a place of leadership to uh, 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 reconstruct the world order. And uh, uh, China only tactically Exploited, exploited the vacuum left by the, uh, the US. So how do you think of these three different positions? What I see is that the, the liberal position has lost ground, while the anonymous position has gained uh, ground uh, because China has been increasingly proactive uh, to uh, reshape the norms of the world order. And uh, US as a founder of the order uh, now is unwilling to defend and even pay uh, for the order. So that's the current situation. But still, I think from my reading of the literature, uh, most scholars have uh, continued to, to hold a wet and see position, which is my own position Two, let me uh, tell you why I think so. To uh, start, we have to understand what is the US net world order, which I think is mostly the UN charter system based upon a hybrid uh, when fighting principle and uh, globalist aspiration of transnational norms. The other part of the US net world order is the US net interstate alliance systems system and uh, uh, which is used mostly to contain China's uh, rise. Uh, in this context, uh, uh, China uh, is of, of course not a stake, uh, stakeholder. Uh, in fact, the one China of the week, uh, the uh, uh, newly founded PRC was even a revolutionary state at that time then gradually they became a stakeholder after Deng Xiaoping started uh, economic and uh, uh, economic reform in 1980s. And, uh, but uh, a rising China uh, has uh, uh, regarded the US net order at this time unfair and unreasonable and uh, have uh, challenged uh, the current international order as a regionalist uh, power. In fact, from my readings uh, of uh, China's uh, complaints as a regional power uh, uh, have uh, uh, focused on the three aspects. First, the post-World War II order was created, China was not on the table, um, was uh, created by United States uh, as a predominant power to conform uh, American values and protect American power. So in that case, China has been an outlier, but not being a democracy. So China has not been very comfortable in this order. The second complaint is that uh, China started for quite a while uh, complaint about uh, US promotion of liberal values has created a lot of chaos. Uh, conflict, uh, color revolution in the world. And uh, China has been very nervous about uh, what US has done to promote liberal values as a, uh, a top dog in the uh, international system. Uh, and then in the last several years, especially since Trump uh, came to uh, power, uh, China has criticized the US as a founder of this new liberal order has been uh, a, a, a um, destroyer of the order. That's what the really interesting that reading Chinese literature. China said, you want to have a rules-based order, but we don't know what kind of rules you are uh, uh, asking us to follow you because uh, there's, there are no rules you respect now. The third aspect of China's complaints uh, um, are uh, US uh, uh, has been, uh, uh, has hold, held, uh, uh, double standard 
because uh, U.S. Uh, uh, has built international rules to guide the actions of only other states and resisted submitting itself to the rules. It hopes others will follow. There are so many examples you can see China has side. The most side example is that now in the South China Sea, for example, this said uh, the U.S. has claimed uh, that UN clause, uh, UN convention uh, uh, on the Sea of Law uh, 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 is part of the customary international law for the freedom of operation uh, in the South China Sea. But the U.S. has not signed, not ratified the UN clause. So Washington has insisted others to obey the treaty rules that U.S. Uh, has refused to accept. So China has uh, a lot of complaints about the current uh, 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 world order dominated by the United States. And China therefore has become a challenger for sure. Uh, we examine uh, the uh, current uh, US net world uh, order. And this challenge has also come in the three aspects. First, uh, China has proposed uh, its own vision for the future of the uh, global order. In fact, uh, you can see, especially since uh, Prince Xi Jinping came to office, ha he, has to, uh, he has called to show Chinese characteristics, Chinese style and Chinese ambitions, and also provide Chinese solutions and Chinese wisdoms to the reform of the global governance and the world order. And uh, for this pur purpose, he has presented uh, the Chinese vision, which is very interesting, called the, the community of shared future for the mankind, uh, which was translated into English as the community of common destiny for mankind at first. Then they changed the, 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 the destiny, this term, um, becomes, in fact, uh, I talked to some people in China, uh, implies a lack of choice, uh, a long predetermined uh, tra trajectory. So that could uh, cause resistance. Therefore, they have a transnet now standardized as the community of shared future for mankind, which is much more benign from the Chinese perspective. Then what are the essences of this uh, Chinese vision of the community of shared future for the, uh, mankind. I see that is a uh, uh, three aspects also. First, they try to reject the Western uh, universal values, which they don't think could represent uh, Chinese uh, uh, visions, Chinese uh, values. Second, it calls for all social political system to be respected as equal valid. In other words, uh, democracies are not a model of superior to authoritarianism. Third, all sh political systems, all different values should uh, peacefully coexist. No attempting to, uh, uh, to transform the others. So I think that's the Chinese vision of the uh, future of the world, of the world peaceful, peacefully coexistence of all different political systems. That's the uh, vision. Uh, second, China, they have their own vision to change the Western values. The second aspect is that China has competed, challenged the U.S. dominance in the global uh, institutions and demanded uh, a greater representation and voice and voting shares in and outside the UN system. Let me give you some examples. Uh, and they have criticized, for example, uh, when the financial crisis started 2009, that uh, a dollar-based uh, single current system was a cause for the global financial crisis. And therefore, they proposed the renminbi to be included in the basket of key international uh, currencies, the dollar, euro, pound, and yuan, uh, as what they call the special as, as uh, SDR, special draw, draw, drawing rights. And it, it, it was included in 2015. And China also requested and demanded uh, the, the rights of the Chinese voting share 
uh, in the IMF, which also uh, uh, approved, adopted 2015. And uh, China has held a lot of important positions in the UN uh, agencies uh, and uh, organizations. In fact, uh, uh, very impressively is that uh, among the 15 specialized agencies of UN, China now uh, held helm. Chinese nationals have uh, had leadership of uh, uh, four, uh, almost one third of those positions. Uh, let me give you the, these names of this uh, organization. When the Food and Agriculture Organization, FOA, the other is International Telecommunication Union, then UN uh, Industrial Development Organization and International Civil Aviation uh, Organization. Uh, these important positions helped, helped China, not only in the economic uh, uh, terms, but also to serve its uh, political objectives. Uh, most um, often, a uh, sign example here is that China has used that position to exclude Taiwan from even observers' position. Uh, for example, in uh, um, uh, uh, aviation, I mean, International Civil Aviation Organization, which is very important for the uh, uh, aviation safety, but Taiwan is not even uh, included as an observer. WTO, uh, for many years, uh, 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 Taiwan was included. Uh, when Ma ying was elected, at that time, a Chinese national from Hong Kong, she was the, the head, and they admitted uh, uh, Taiwan as an observer. And Chen Yingmen was elected 2018, uh, 16, she, the Taiwan was uh, excluded uh, again on, on up to now. Um, uh, not only because China held that position, China has a huge influence on that organization. So uh, in that context, uh, uh, the most recent March uh, election of uh, the UN International, uh, International uh, Intellectual Pro property, right, property Rights Organization, China um, bad was blocked by the US and uh, some Western countries. If China got that one, it would be one third, five positions. Uh, outside of uh, UN uh, system, China also have created Beijing inspired international economic institutions, uh, uh, such as the New Development Bank uh, of uh, BRIC countries, which is headquartered in, uh, in Shanghai, which is, is, you can tell, the influence of China and also AIB is a very good example that China started and has become very powerful international organization uh, headquartered in Beijing and headed always by Chinese national. Third aspect of China challenge uh, is that uh, uh, China has tried to impose its uh, sovereignty centered value to the global governance by promoting a state enhancing uh, globalization. That's what China has uh, uh, do. In fact, for not observers, uh, uh, they have been kind of puzzled by the uh, China emerging as an uh, unlikely championship for globalization since President Trump came to office, which caused a, a huge backlash against globalization. But the globalization that China has uh, uh, promoted uh, is very different from liberal globalization once promoted by the US and others. According to the Chinese scholar Wang Yunwei, in fact, I read his article, he talked about each country must, max, ma must make a choice of globaliz globalization that is good for itself. China has promoted economic globalization supported by political multipolarity and multiculturalism. While liberal nationalism promoted by the West emphasizes political democratization, economic privatization, and universalization of liberal values. China has criticized the Western promoted liberal uh, uh, globalization uh, for uh, the uh, a lot of problems, especially disparity, income distribution, inequality, all those problems globally, regionally, uh, inside of uh, countries, uh, 
and uh, that they, they argue that you can read Chinese scholars uh, scholarship. In fact, uh, I think this is also very popular now in the Western scholarship, talking about inequality uh, globally, and they blame uh, the globalization, uh, liberal globalization, and uh, new uh, liberal economic uh, 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 thoughts uh, for uh, responsibility for resp responsible for these type of uh, uh, problems. So when the resentments uh, uh, against uh, liberal globalization is on the rise, China has posed its own vision of globalization. And that's what I call statist uh, globalization. Uh, leaves more leeways, rooms for states to conduct itself as they place to roll back those liberal globalization. So this uh, statist uh, globalization has expressed in many aspects, economically see the state capitalism relying on industrial policy to, uh, to compete in a global uh, economy on uh, international arena. This uh, status approach uh, protects state sovereignty against uh, monitoring by the external forces, emphasize consent in international affairs. Uh, uh, this status uh, uh, approach, uh, Chinese sovereignty centered uh, norm of the global governance uh, uh, has guided China's uh, participation in international organizations. For example, China demanded two essential preconditions for UNDP, UN peacekeep, peacekeeping operation, endorsement by the UN Security Council and consent by the government of the host country. But for many years, uh, China was on a defensive side of its status values. But China has become much more aggressive in asserting its values in recent years. Let me give some examples. Um, uh, in a cyber, this kind of fr frontier of the global governance, for example, in a cyberspace uh, role making, the US uh, and the Western countries for many years have uh, uh, advocated uh, so called decentralized multi stakeholder model to have a civil society and government working together, have an open system. But China has uh, 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 insisted the cyber sovereignty to regulate uh, uh, cyberspace, its own cyberspace, and build the independent uh, internet with separate system of Chinese technology and a great firewall. China has basically walled its own internet into an internal uh, net, uh, separate from the global uh, uh, cyber space. Some people even use, uh, use the uh, cyber totalitarianism to describe Chinese uh, model. And uh, uh, this competition now has been going ongoing. China has been very offensive on this, uh, aggressive on this. Uh, and also on the human rights uh, front, uh, China has its own uh, vision of uh, uh, human rights. Basically, they see uh, a priority of human rights protection in de developing countries is different from the priority in the West. The economic development rights and social rights are more fundamental in that case than individual and civil political rights. The proper balance uh, uh, is to be determined, determined by the state according to their so-called national conditions. That's what the Chinese um, often said. And uh, so in that context, using that for quite a while, these kind of uh, concepts are in the defensive uh, side, but now China has been very offensive on this uh, because uh, US withdrawal from UN uh, uh, Human Rights Council, for example, gave China a lot of opportunities. And China has uh, very often in that case, China has been a member of UN Human Rights Council and pulled the uh, democratic, democratic Western countries in the minority uh, coming to the vote. Uh, China has introduced quite a few its own resolutions uh, to the UN Human Rights Council since 2007, which were have been adopted. Uh, the Chinese resolutions have emphasized the rights of states and did not have any balancing um, references to the rights of individuals, the role of civil society uh, groups and demanding for the monitoring um, process. Uh, and uh, so China basically taking human rights 
uh, out of the uh, individual rights out of the picture and uh, frame human rights as purely a matter for the state. And uh, this position has been enhanced in the UN Human Rights uh, Council. And China has also used the UN Human Rights Council uh, to protect its own behavior. For example, uh, this year, July, you, the 44th UN Human Rights Council, uh, 27 countries supported UN-led uh, joint statement to criticize China's action in Xinjiang and uh, its national security law uh, in Hong Kong. But 46 countries dismissed, they have a statement by 46 countries dismissed the criticism about China in Xinjiang. And another statement by, signed by 53 countries defend China's position in Hong Kong. So that's really, I think, amazing to see how the Chinese offensive being successful and supported by uh, in the international uh, arena. And China's statist uh, uh, values uh, has also, get, I think, can further grant during the pandemic uh, uh, this year. Because uh, for many Chinese, uh, they have claimed uh, they are uh, uh, centralized the state power to handle, to cope with the pandemic was many, very successful. And many Western countries, Western democracies have copied, and they used this term, Chao uh, Zuo Ye. They have uh, copied the Chinese way, I mean, Chinese state-centric uh, way to deal with the pandemic. For example, uh, and while, uh, although some Western countries, I mean, US have uh, uh, criticized uh, uh, China's uh, surveillance technology uh, uh, as a uh, cyber or surveillance uh, country, uh, China used that technology to track people's contacts with the virus successful. Now they said, see, the Western countries, uh, UK and uh, some other countries, Israel, all those countries, uh, uh, Singapore, uh, not Singapore, Taiwan, Hong, Taiwan uh, and uh, uh, South Korea, they all did the same thing. And the uh, uh, US has not done that. So US is, uh, uh, has become the epicenter of the pandemic. And also another example, um, people have talked about is that many Western countries have now uh, uh, immunized China state capitalism and uh, adopted industrial policy. And the Trump administration using tariffs, not only tariffs, and also industrial policy, tried to promote the U.S. domestic manufacture and uh, uh, certain sectors uh, and uh, banned uh, foreign companies in the state, uh, um, especially Chinese uh, uh, competitors. Uh, most uh, ironically, they also um, pointed out that the uh, U.S. now embraced view of uh, internet sovereignty because they try to um, um, block, ban the Chinese. Uh, I mean, they have a clean network program to ban virtually all Chinese information technology products. Now we all talk about TikTok. And uh, uh, so uh, even not only the uh, Trump administration, I just read an article this week of uh, Foreign Affairs by Hillary Clinton talking about the uh, national security ranking, how Washington should think, think about power, which also emphasized uh, the, uh, the, the, the importance of uh, industrial policy, the state-led uh, uh, industrial uh, economic um, policy. So I, I'm really amazed uh, that uh, has happened. So that's why China has been, uh, this kind of challenge has been so serious. Finally, now let's talk the final uh, question. Is China ready to replace the US net water with a China net order? And the answer, our answers to this question depends on uh, your assessment of the following three developments. One is uh, if China have, has enough power to dislodge the U.S. power and provide global leadership and sweeping global public goods. The second uh, assessment and development is, uh, could China provide alternative venues universally accepted? Third, what is the China's cost benefits to replace or maintain the order? So let's uh, look at each of uh, these questions. 
in fact, uh, uh, my answer is uh, the uh, going back to the very beginning of the talk. We have to wait and see, because China. I don't think China has. Uh, we have a clear answer, or positive answer, to all the three uh, questions. Let's look at the first question. Uh, I don't think China is in a position, or even close to the position, to dislodge the U.S. power. China is still, I think my former advisor, as a uh, Professor Vogel mentioned in my Susan Shirk book, a fragile, a fragile uh, rising power. It's still the case, although China is much more powerful, but still, still fragile. And it faces in, in, enormous, I think, external and internal hurdles for its continued economic growth. People talk about the uh, so-called mid-income mid uh, trap. There has not been a, a larger economy uh, uh, passed over. I mean, uh, became uh, 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 entered the rich country club from the mid-income level without uh, having a political liberalization so far. So we don't know if China could become the first authoritarian state to uh, avoid this uh, uh, trap because there are so many problem internally and uh, externally. And people talk about the uh, demographic uh, change, environmental destruction, uh, overcapacity, and uh, local government dates, and all those problems. I don't know. I mean, we have uh, 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 economists who can answer that. Uh, even people argue that the China economy has come to the peak. I don't know if I would uh, go that far, but slowdown has been very real and it can, uh, externally uh, um, China's uh, uh, environment, external environment, I think uh, has become really, really challenging. That China leadership has realized that one after another country has uh, tried to uh, close themselves to the Chinese products or many other uh, things. Uh, so Shi uh, Yinghong, uh, the Chinese scholar, he used that term, the risk of a strategic overdraft. For China, I think it's a very real. We have to wait and see. So in that context for China to mobilize resources, to provide sweeping global public goods, to take global leadership, to reconstruct international order, I don't think we can have a very positive answer to this uh, uh, question. China has been pretty much and uh, kind of a uh, double A, uh, two phases. They talk a lot rhetorics, but in action, they have uh, hesitate to take responsibilities, to even take obligations. The climate change is a good example. Even during the pandemic, China's uh, 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 so-called uh, uh, assistance are not really assistance. They are not global public goods. They are uh, those goods serving China's strategic interests in the name of um, uh, public goods. Second, I don't think China has, uh, uh, is in a position to provide alternative uh, uh, values uh, uh, universally acceptable by uh, the world. In fact, the vision of the community of shared future for mankind has often been confused with the Tianxia or the Pax Senecala uh, vision or the order. Um, uh, uh, which is based upon power and hierarchy, hierarchy instead of uh, freedom and equality, which, has, which would be very difficult to be accepted uh, by other uh, countries. Uh, I talked an article in my journal by John Dreyer. He lists the three conditions that uh, the Tianxia order could be accepted. One uh, is that uh, China is the largest and most powerful state. Second is civilization. Superiority is widely acknowledged. Third, in the absence of a competing paradigm, none of them exist today. So given choice in this case, most countries will still uh, 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 want to navigate uh, in a world order where if the US is going to continue taking leadership. Uh, so uh, to com compensate for the shortage of, shortage of the uh, soft power all uh, alternative value. China has promoted, uh, have to kind of um, uh, um, brand, um, uh, um, uh, 
um, uh, branding campaign, Confucian tools, and a lot of the media uh, campaign, none of them have been accepted, uh, successful, telling the China story, so-called, uh, have not been accepted because they don't appeal to the universal uh, values. And third, I would argue that China still is a beneficiary of the US net world order economically, uh, except Trump. Uh, the US uh, for so many years have tried to maintain a uh, uh, free uh, uh, trade system and uh, uh, free uh, open economic uh, system. China benefited dramatically. Uh, it's still benefiting today on the security uh, arena, China is also a beneficiary of uh, U.S. maintained the regional and global order. Just give example. Uh, it, it, if, for, if the U.S. is totally withdrawing from Asia, is that good for China? Japan will become nuclear power and uh, some other countries will follow Japan. China will face a very uh, nightmare of uh, environment in Asia. I don't think that's in China interests. So uh, given uh, that the situation, China is not uh, ready to take uh, global leadership and uh, reconstruct the world order, but China is making challenges. China has uh, 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 a lot of uh, complaints about the order. What should we do? Here are the two questions I don't have answers to conclude. How should the US and international community uh, deal with China as a revisionist power? Many people have uh, uh, said, oh, we should accommodate China's legitimate uh, demands and uh, try to balance uh, the, the encouragement and discouragement. We should welcome China to sit on the table of a rulemaking uh, uh, system. Uh, and that's a lot of people talking about that, but opposite uh, view has a so strong argument, China is region is power, not only revision power, some other people even argue that China is revolutionary power to, to overthrow the US net order. How can we uh, coexist with China in that context? The second question is that uh, uh, where we go, where do we go from here? Uh, many people have argued that we come to a global disorder because we don't have a leadership. U.S. is no longer willing to pay or defend the system. China is not ready. So it's a global disorder, which in the pandemic, we don't see the global uh, collaboration, which is a non-security issue, most uh, urgent need of cooperation. So we come to a global, I mean, G zero world, which is very dangerous. Uh, 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 everyone for themselves and uh, strong what they can and weak suffer what they must. Is that the situation or how can we uh, find ways to deal with those problems? So those are uh, uh, the, my conclusion questions. Okay, I will stop here. We can uh, go to uh, whatever next stage is. Uh, thank you uh, for, um, okay, start my video. Okay, um, everybody can hear me now? Uh, you can hear me now, Bill? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, uh, well, thank you very much for that very comprehensive uh, presentation of the most fundamental issue we face, and that is, uh, the challenge of China to the U.S. position around the world. Uh, in my view, the United States uh, has done things to block China's rise. I mean, it encouraged other countries not to join the bank, uh, the AIIB, and uh, it has uh, not uh, welcomed uh, Chinese uh, rise in international organization, number of international organizations. Now, supposing that uh, after the Biden, if Biden becomes president, we have a somewhat new perspective. Supposing we realize that the uh, Belt and Road Initiative is really good for many countries in the whole Euro-Asia Peninsula, 
and the United States would express interest in cooperating with China. Uh, China has announced that it wants to have a shared future for mankind. Do you think that China would welcome U.S. participation in uh, some uh, Belt Road initiative? Could we have some cooperative projects uh, or would China, is China now getting so confident that it would not accept such initiatives? What's your thought on that, Sui Shang? I think China still, uh, uh, at least uh, uh, in a rhetoric, welcoming the US uh, and the Western multilateral cooperation to join the uh, BRI because uh, it has a lot of problems so far and the transparency and the uh, date uh, issue and the conflict of interest of China and some uh, local uh, host countries, uh, which could not be, and, and also the role making many, many problems. So mm -hmm. in the second uh, uh, BIA summit 2009, I think last year, uh, Xi Jinping already, I think, uh, uh, re uh, uh, thought about this issue and talked about welcoming the Western companies uh, to join them. But in the deep part, I don't know how the Chinese leaders will think about that, because that will make this uh, um, uh, initiative very different from what they have imagined. The good example is AIB. And China started to uh, try to make AIB or China, Chinese foreign policy, just like a China Development Bank, China Export Import Bank, uh, to for China development projects. And when they opened up, the Western countries come in. It's a totally different animal now. It's much more like a multinational international institution, which is not a Chinese institution. Although Jin Yichun still is the governor, uh, a Chinese national but it has followed international uh, practices, uh, international uh, uh, subject to the green uh, environmental protection, a lot of those things China would not uh, have control. So it, it, I don't know if that's what China wants. I don't think that China wants. The, the, the difference between AIB and uh, BRI is that uh, AIB now is a truly multilateral and uh, BRI is a multi, by natural agreements. There are 100 countries, they all signed by natural agreements with China. So China is still the center. China controls this uh, project. So that's what I think the, the dilemma, the contradiction China has uh, in a relationship with, with, uh, with US and West, Western countries. Yes, the AIB was not, not what they originally envisioned, but in a way China has adapted. Uh, and the fact that uh, they have retained the same president uh, and they've adapted in a way that AIB in a way is uh, an example of uh, shared uh, future. Uh, right, exactly, theoretically, but in practice, uh, BI is a, a signature of Xi Jinping's big power diplomacy. AIB is a different animal. So in that case, I don't know how much, how flexible Xi Jinping would be on the BRA to, to follow the example of a B, uh, AIB, which I think is a great success. Uh, another question you didn't go into deeply uh, in Chinese leadership is uh, not only the question of whether the values could be acceptable, but whether China allows enough openness that countries could go to China. I mean, now the United States, as you know, we have a large number of foreign students and before the coronavirus, we had 365,000 <coughs> Chinese students in the United States. But now China has a uh, propaganda department and certain ideas cannot be discussed and certain ideas are closed. And given uh, world leadership, well, that, is it possible that that system uh, can still provide the leadership when it doesn't allow the open discussion 
uh, and uh, is not attractive to people to go to China to take part in that discussion. Uh, how do you think China can adapt, or do you think that foreign countries can accept leadership without taking part in discussion? No, I don't think so. Uh, at least that under Xi Jinping's uh, tenure, there is no hope China would open up uh, political uh, discussion on open uh, on all th those uh, sensitive. Uh, issues. Uh, in fact, I see a backward move, movement since Xi Jinping came to office. And uh, the, for example, uh, the publications, because I'm running the journal, I can tell that uh, <laughs> uh, for quite a while, the Chinese uh, uh, universities encouraged their uh, scholars to publish in international journals, uh, meaning English language journals. But now they have discouraged their scholars to publish overseas, especially, I mean, mostly in the social sciences and humanities. They give a more emphasis to domestic journals publication, and which is- foreign, And also foreign scholars are not uh, publishing <coughs> China. I mean, they made it difficult. Yeah, right, they, they will not allow you to have those, they will censor. So how oh. can China be a global leader and accept it exactly. as global leader? So if the China's continue that, Mm -hmm. Yes. So that would in, uh, require some adjustment on the part of... So right, but I don't see that adjustment you coming. You don't see that in the near future. So the question is whether they could play that role uh, in the future. No, no, uh, I don't think so. Uh, Nick, I'm going to have to have uh, figure out a way to look... I, I think uh, Professor Shaw has uh, raised his hand several times. Uh, Bill Xiao, uh, it's your... Uh, We'll see, let you raise the question orally. Bill, go ahead. Well, I have a burning question. I found your talk is very interesting. You really touch about this, a fundamental issue, challenging the world and China. So my, you talk a great deal about the values. Can you elaborate more? Values are based on ethics and philosophy. Can you elaborate more? What is the philo philosophical base of Chinese values? Because in my view, a great deal of these rhetorics China give out is ad hoc to serve their current uh, international position, rather than go back to what is the common universal value that China embrace, or hopefully the world embrace. I think you are right. China has been very utilitarian in terms of values. And they just see everything in the lens of uh, utility. If it's useful uh, for the Communist Party stay in power, if it's useful for China's economic modernization, that's what the China has uh, 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 constructed. I mean, uh, uh, the lens China has looked through in terms of values. In, in that context, uh, China has not been able to offer any long-term vision for the world, even the uh, uh, community of a shared future for mankind is so empty other than to serve the Communist Party's uh, uh, lead to resist Western values. So that's the um, problem for the Chinese uh, uh, value system at this time. Bill, do you want to raise a question too? I can't hear you, Bill. Are you push the uh, uh, unmute? We can't hear you, Bill. Okay. Um, here, here is one question from TK Chu. Within your framework, if more rising economies take the China route, like will it that increase or decrease the rivalry between the existing world order? Mm. So the question is, uh, given the current development, 
Yeah, yeah I'll repeat the question. Um, uh, if more rising economies take the China route like Vietnam, will that increase or decrease the rivalry between the okay. world order? Uh, uh, so I think uh, uh, if uh, more countries, uh, I mean, people talk convergence, convergence of values, uh, political system in the past. Uh, um, but uh, uh, what they talked mostly was uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the Chinese system and the authoritarian values will converge called liberal values. But now what we have seen is uh, both sides. Uh, uh, China, China has insisted on its uh, authoritarian value and uh, the Western countries have been changing. The Western countries have been so con concerned about China influence, uh, authoritarian influence in the Western societies. So the uh, conver convergence uh, has not happened. And uh, the conflict between China and other parts of the world, especially uh, the conflicts with the United States, has based not only on the economic uh, interests, but I think the value conflict has been real. So if China has uh, changed, uh, like Vietnam, uh, or beyond Vietnam, I think this kind of conflicts will be reduced. And uh, China could work with China, US much better. Uh, in, in, uh, although uh, there are still some conflicts in the issues, but uh, in the overall environment will be different. Uh, here's a question from Wei Liang. Uh, given the current development of decoupling US withdrawal from a number of multilateral institutions, is it likely that China and the United States will create a bifurcated system of global institutions? Do you, in other words, do you expect some decoupling in certain areas? Uh, it looked like Trump was moving in that direction. Uh, but if you look at the business institution, this is my addition to the question. Um, if you look at the business institutions, uh, interesting survey by the Shanghai American Chamber of Commerce, companies intend to stay and only something like 3% of them are planning to move out within the next year. Uh, so decoupling business-wise is not going very far. But what about, what's your estimate as to how far and what areas decoupling uh, might take place in, at the strategic or political level internationally? I, uh, decoupling, I think, is real at this time. For quite a while, I was... Uh, uh, very uh, optimistic because of the global economic uh, independent, interdependence. But now we have seen the real uh, 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 deep coupling taking place, especially in the technology, uh, technology front. Uh, we will see two different, for example, in the cyberspace, we'll see two different eco uh, uh, systems for sure. And uh, China would create its own standards, own uh, systems and uh, U.S. would have uh, and Western countries will have their own uh, standards uh, uh, and the 5G, all those kind of systems will see uh, decoupling uh, for sure. And uh, also in uh, uh, some uh, uh, other uh, economic uh, of, of a production chain, for example, is another uh, side. Uh, redundancy uh, has been uh, uh, increase now because of the, the pandemic, uh, for, for example, uh, the uh, uh, medical equipments mm -hmm. and uh, uh, supplies. Uh, a lot of countries try to have their own uh, stocks and own, stock, own production. In fact, I read uh, 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 Harry Clinton's article. She argued that uh, the U.S. Uh, uh, over reliance, uh, uh, over uh, reliance on Chinese supplies uh, have a uh, uh, rendered U.S. Uh, vulnerable. So U.S. have to build its own uh, uh, supply system, which is redundant uh, with China. And China also have, uh, uh, Xi Jinping has talked so much now about uh, self-reliance on the technology. Those kind of critical technology, you cannot buy them. Uh, you cannot rely on other countries. You have to produce yourselves. So in this case, I think the separate decoupled uh, technology systems 
will be very real and the production chain system. Although uh, on the second part of the question, although uh, it's uh, still at this moment very difficult because uh, uh, the, the, the established production and value chains have been uh, to be changed, um, to change them, the cost is very high. As uh, the Shanghai uh, um, US uh, uh, Chamber of Commerce uh, survey uh, tell a lot of companies, they move out of China, the cost is very high. They cannot do it. So uh, you can see the economic interdependence is still working, but the political will has intervened at this time. So decoupling is a real threat now for the global well, the next question is one we're all uh, thinking about. Uh, in the American election, uh, if it's Trump, then what do we expect? If it's Biden, what do we expect? So in terms of the issues you've been discussing today, uh, what effect do you think that election, uh, how would it be if Trump continues another four year? How do you expect it might go if Biden comes into power? I think many, everyone will have their own answers uh, to this uh, question. Today and, we're uh, giving you your chance. We'll have right, my own <laughs> shot on, on this. I think if uh, Trump uh, is uh, elected, uh, he will continue this chaotic uh, policy uh, very ad hoc and uh, somehow have two pranks to do uh, admire Xi Jinping's power and uh, to use uh, uh, whatever he can use to enhance his own uh, uh, power. Uh, in the meantime, he, he is uh, as a business, per business person and uh, uh, he has so many uh, real complaints about China, which also I think is real, supported by many uh, facts. Uh, so he will continue the current uh, confrontation against China. In fact, uh, it's so clear for me that uh, if Trump is elected, uh, China and US will continue the so-called Cold War with China, the new Cold War, Cold War II. Uh, US, uh, uh, there is a strong sentiment among US allies against China's uh, threat. And they have uh, somehow been closing and uh, closer to the US position, not because Trump, because uh, they are, in their uh, own uh, interests. So US will use that uh, to build a uh, uh, containment line against China. So this uh, uh, confrontation will continue. If um, uh, Joe Biden is enacted, I think the overall confrontation direction will not be changed, but the strategy will be very different. I don't think uh, uh, Joe Biden uh, is going to continue a cold wall, although he will not uh, continue going back to gold, old, gold, old, old good days, which cannot uh, go back. Um, but he would uh, find what areas uh, U.S. Can, can collaborate with China, but also what uh, areas U.S. could, uh, should uh, roll back China, uh, working together with uh, allies and uh, other countries. He will emphasize more on the value uh, issues, human rights, uh, all those issues. He will return, I think, uh, should return to those uh, international organizations Trump uh, withdrawal from. And uh, so it will be very different. Personally, the final question here, personally, I hope uh, Joe Biden will win. So <laughs> I think he will win for sure. <laughs> uh, I think you'll find a lot of people probably in your audience today who would have the same choice. Um, our next question uh, is by Professor Naval War College, uh, Colonel Steve Schinkel. He says, uh, you were discussing China's supply and US challenges there. The EU seems to be concerned with China's efforts to change the international order. Can you discuss how other players will counter or support China's move uh, to change the order, specifically the EU? Uh, and I might uh, add to that, um, say uh, Japan and Korea, which I think are also very important players. But why don't you start with the EU? I don't think EU would uh, support China's uh, 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 challenge to the uh, existing order. In contrast, I think the EU countries uh, 
have uh, uh, pushed back in the last several years, uh, 2019, uh, that the outlook put the China for the first time as a systemic rival. I think China has been very unhappy about it. But I think most European countries have taken that position, even Italy, which has been part of the BRI. I don't think they have been very happy on the China pressure on these countries. Uh, even during the pandemic, China used those uh, um, mask diplomacy, tried to push them to support China positions, uh, which I think backfired. And uh, globally, I think the only country supported China uh, unconditionally, I mean, only two countries, uh, two countries, I would say, one is Russia, the other is Iran, excess of evil, if you can use that term. <laughs> and uh, uh, even North Korea, I don't think it's uh, very clear on the China side. Uh, uh, Japan, South Korea, Australia, Canada, and uh, uh, all those uh, 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 democracies in the world, I think now got some problems uh, with China. That, as I said earlier, that uh, uh, the Trump has tried to build a containment, the Trump impression has tried to build a containment line against China. Uh, uh, although most countries don't like Trump, but has been successful by default because these countries have problems with China. So China, I think at this time, if I were China leaders, I'll be very concerned internationally because China has been very, very isolated at this time. I will argue that. Uh, a related question, uh, this is from Grant Road at Boston University. Uh, will Europe be a contested football between China and the United States? And will the competition accelerate uh, the demise of the liberal order? What will the competition between China and the United States look like over Europe? Uh, I don't know if it, it, it is a test ground uh, to the extent uh, that both US and China have tried to pull Europe to their own side at this time. But uh, I will say Wang Yi's visit, for example, Chinese leadership visit, Wang Yi and uh, Yang Jiechi's visit to Europe, uh, and last month was not successful at all. And uh, um, Pompeo has uh, made many trips, uh, US uh, diplomats has, have made many trip, trips too. And uh, there are a lot of uh, problems between US and uh, 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 European countries, but uh, the European countries, I don't think they want to make choice between China and the US, but if they have to make choice at this time, it seems like they are in a position I think they would make choice more, more part of the United States than China. So that's the issue now facing European countries and also only European countries and Japan, South Korea, and Australia. And Australia, I think have, has given very clear answer. They stand with the United States and uh, they have uh, now pushed back so hard against China. So uh, there are this kind of, uh, 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 taken side uh, as a test ground. And uh, when you ask the question, they talk about global order, partially because of uh, these countries have uh, identified with the US uh, uh, liberal, or liberal values. Although Trump has not uh, uh, carried out, have not uh, recognized these, uh, followed these values, but these value themselves, I think has been recognized, accepted by those countries. Another uh, question here is about uh, Africa, which we haven't talked about, and the China's governance methods of <clears throat> state owned enterprises, support of uh, economic uh, development uh, is uh, quite uh, 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 prominent and widely accepted in Africa. And does this uh, undermine the West's liberal message? Will it uh, contribute to the development in Africa? And uh, uh, we had a speaker on uh, Latin America recently, uh, so, uh, points out that in South America, uh, many countries are also receptive uh, to the need for economic development. And will China have more appeal uh, to those countries and will it be more successful and more helpful to those countries in their development uh, than the United States has been? Uh, 
I think that this is a very, very important question here. I did not mention that. Uh, in fact, uh, it's so clear China appeals have uh, mostly uh, taught uh, the global South, including Africa, Latin America, and those uh, non-Western countries. Uh, they have to a great extent sympathetic and also benefited uh, from the China model of uh, modernization. And uh, so they have, uh, those authoritarian leaders uh, have uh, to a great extent uh, accepted the Chinese uh, vision of uh, uh, global order. Here is a shared uh, future. That's what the shared future here. Also, this uh, development has also taken place in the context of uh, 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 declining or backsliding of democracies in the West. So these countries uh, have uh, seen China as an increasingly powerful partner uh, for their future, for their development. In fact, uh, to certain, they make sense because of, uh, for these countries, the fundamental issue of uh, 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 instability, all those kind of problems are poverty and uh, not a, a democracy or, or political liberalization. So they think if China could help them to uh, irradiate, uh, uh, eliminate uh, poverty, and, uh, and they don't think that in that case, they will follow the Western models. And uh, so, uh, the, the, if there's a new emerging Cold War, I will uh, say that uh, China, Russia, uh, Iran, and also Global South. And the other side is the US uh, and European countries, Australia, Japan, I, I, even maybe Japan, South Korea is in the middle. They don't want to make choice at this time. So it's a, such a clear line, uh, strong, uh, uh, that on the side, China and Global South. The final question, <clears throat> we haven't talked about internal developments within China, but the question is, um, and it's very hard, of course, for anybody to try to answer, and that is, what, do, what is the kind of support within China for a more liberal, open, uh, transparent uh, structure? Something, uh, uh, the return to what I like to think personally is, is the Deng Xiaoping era, when there, in the, even the Hui Albang era, when there was more openness. Um, what would, or how would you go about trying to evaluate the possibilities of uh, that in China's future? Or wh what are some of your thoughts about that? That'll be the final question for the day. There's no future if a uh, current leadership continues in office, which I think will be quite a while. So the openness uh, and the liberal ideas uh, in China has been silenced. In fact, there was a small hope when the pandemic started uh, because of the mishandlement, mismanagement of the pandemic virus at the very beginning. We saw those internet uh, uh, postings against like uh, Xu Zhangren and uh, Ren Zhiqiang, and uh, those people, they, their um, uh, views uh, at, at the, for a couple of weeks, I think, was uh, circulated very uh, um, viral in uh, Chinese uh, uh, controlled, state controlled uh, internet. I was uh, very excited. Some people also in the West uh, uh, predict that that was a Chinese uh, uh, Chernobyl moment, meeting the beginning of the ending of the Corpus Party and the rising of a liberal uh, movement. But unfortunately, that has not happened because uh, Chinese government has been very successful using their state power to control the virus and also control the, uh, the voice, the, the, uh, this, this dissent voice, arrest them, even uh, uh, put them in jail, fire them from office, from their jobs, very successful. And uh, the popular um, uh, sentiments today is so strongly aligned with the government. And this is from my own personal uh, experiences. Those uh, even Western educated scholars in China, uh, in Beijing University, in Renmin University, even in Tsinghua University, all those places, you can see, I, I don't think they pretend it. They are very strong supporter of the uh, <coughs> authoritarian uh, government. They think that this time, authoritarianism is the only way for China 
to maintain strong and to keep rise. And the liberal uh, ideas will create problems. Like they have a lot of criticism of liberal uh, system in the US and Western countries. So in that kind of sentiments and the political environment, I don't see any hope anytime soon of liberal development in China. I'll think I'll pin here to come back. <laughs> As you know, there are a lot of uh, Americans who hope that um, if a Biden administration comes in, we can still show the excesses uh, of a liberal order and some advantages to China. But we really appreciate your very broad, uh, broad brushed. Uh, Let me add one sentence here on this subject. I oh. think we now really should revisit Andy Nathan's uh, uh, theme, authoritarian resilience. And now the research uh, is not no longer uh, when China will become democratic, is why China will not become democratic. <laughs> yes, and uh, uh, last year you published uh, between him and Joe Fusmith. Yeah, that <laughs> a very interesting debate on that issue. Right, and that's that's exactly the right question now to ask today. Read, read that issue. Uh, next week we're going to try something different. Uh, in order to go to Asia. It's very hard to ask people to get up at the middle of the night and address us. So next week we have somebody in Asia uh, and uh, they've kindly agreed to talk to us at eight, 8 in the morning. That will be 8 p.m. our time. So we're trying the unusual experiment next week of meeting at 8 p.m. And the speaker will be Wang Gongwu. Uh, many of you will agree with me that he is uh, if not the leading um, historian of China uh, outside of China, uh, at least uh, one of the very handful. And he's been a wonderful, thoughtful person about thinking what history has to do with the contemporary uh, period of China. And so he's kindly agreed to uh, address us next. He will get up at uh, speak at 8 a.m. in Singapore time. It will be 8 p.m. our time. I hope many of you will join us. Thank you all for joining us today. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Sam. Bye. Thank you. Thank you so much.